The boss man is on holiday for a couple of uh, couple of weeks, and while he's gone, we hacked his computer and we've set up this new code, which is uh, Sargon. Uh, and now if you put that in, you're going to get 50% off um, any tier on the website where there's lots of fascinating stuff. And we've been having a bit of a bit of a thing this week where we talk about um, some of the um, exciting, interesting, engaging people. But we've also got to cover Harry. Harry, what is it that uh, what is it that you do for us? Uh, well, I do plenty of things, mm. actually. Uh, thank you for asking. Yeah. I do Comics Corner with wow. Connor, which is a not a weekly series. It's a monthly series for those who are slightly more patient of our subscribers. It's more, uh, I, I like to think it's got a bit more prestige to it that way, a bit of Premier a, it's, plus, pr it's for the yeah. patrician viewers, right. really, if we think about it. So you're an economist, yes. you know, or know, know the economics of it. So you understand supply and demand. The less there is of something to the greater demand, the more Scarcity, valuable it is. That's right. In, in value, the marginal yes. utility of an episode of Comics Corner, to my mind, is far right. greater than the marginal utility of, say, a Brokenomics. <laughs> I'll segue into a different question, right? So, so what? I of course what, 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 what does what does Comics Corner uh, teach us? Like, for example, if if I were to watch this, would I would I know if Spider Man could beat a Space Marine? Um, <laughs> I don't think I've read that particular story. Right, uh, we've no, I not, just made it up. We've not we've not actually covered Spider Man. Oh, um, okay. Uh, because C Connor and I due to yeah. our prejudices, have primarily covered a lot of DC comics up until this point. I thought, uh, the I only... thought DC was... the Josh has returned. Hello. Was Hello. DC the rubbish one and the Marvel the good one? I mean, it depends entirely on your opinion, okay. really, doesn't well, it? I'm, I'm uh, if you're thinking... talking about the films, then yes. for a long time people said that DC was the rubbish one, Marvel was the good one. But I think right. now we're all in perfect agreement that they're both absolute rubbish and you shouldn't pay attention yes. to either of them. Uh, well, the, just, just, just want to preface this by saying, uh, Connor and I covering comics does not in any way suggest to anybody watching either this video or the series that you should go out and buy any modern comics being produced by Image, Marvel, or DC. Every single one of them is absolute dribble being poured down your ear, trying to propagandize and brainwash you. Same with the films; they're all crap. Don't watch them. So, so, so that was yeah. So that was basically going to be my next question because. Obviously, when the film started coming out, I thought, oh, I'll, I'll check out the source material. Mm. And, and there was a big comic shop in, in, in town. And you go and buy the comic, and it's like, what the hell is this? Well, that's, that's one of the big problems, really, with trying to get into comic books. The reason that Connor and I yeah. um, are into them, I, I, well, I can't really speak for Connor, but I can speak for myself. <laughs> You're right there, Josh. <laughs> Oh. oh no, it's a disaster. Oh, Look at what's gone Look, on. We, we, we're supposed you to make two beers we're down. We're maintaining this is what the happened. standards while the boss man is away. There are no standards, Dan. No, good, no, now look at you. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm like go. foraging squirrels. God, <laughs> good God. Hmm. All right, so, yes, uh, comic books uh, f for me were something that was more of a product of the time that I grew up in that I got into them because when I was much younger, it was very popular. You first had the first wave of comic book films come out like the original X-Men films and you still had a lot of the television programs from the 90s like the X-Men TV series the Spider-Man like yeah. Spider TV series even reruns of the old Batman animated series always being on TV on the cartoon Banana Man network and, um, I, that, that sounds like something very different no, that's, that, no, that's no, more that, your wheelhouse I'm that, sure that was a thing people will remember alright probably when Eric eats a banana an amazing transformation occurs but it, that just sounds like a rip off of pop art. Yeah, Eric is Banana Man. It must be. It must be before your time. He said it doesn't sound anywhere near as good as Danger Mouse, if you ask me. But still, Danger Mouse was. Yes, yeah, Danger and, Mouse. Yeah, that yeah. was great. Yeah, with when, David Jason. But when I was when I was growing up, you used to go into the news agents, and I think you still can, and you'll get comic books there uh, where they'll print different versions from the ones that you can find in normal comic shops, more for mass consumption. And they had like the Ultimate series from Marvel, so you'd have these enormous printed versions of the Ultimate Spider-Man comics that I used to read all the time. I used to get those. Uh, and I was like six at the time. So when eventually, as all comics do, they reveal themselves to not really be for kids anymore and a character gets horribly raped, murdered in some brutal way or burnt to a crisp right there and then. And I'm like, Mom, Dad, this, is, this isn't what I thought it would be. But still, you know, comics, like... That's dark, isn't it? Uh, ever since around the 1970s... Oh, hang on. If you're a superhero, why would you get raped? I mean, you're... <laughs> I don't think it's the superhero, su typically. I'm trying to think, actually. <laughs> that super, then, are uh, That has happened a few Are times. Are you Russell Brand's lawyer? Well, in, in, 
in the yeah. early t- in the early two thousands, for instance, there was some ridiculous Spider Man t- uh, stories going on where like the Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, was revealed to have had sex with and fathered an un- uh, like a, a bastard child with Gwen Stacy. Spider Man's original girlfriend who died and was replaced. Did, with Mary did these Jane. allegations come out at the time, or was it like eleven years later this, when this the Green were, Goblin came this out? This story, this, this story was about thirty years after the death of Gwen yeah. Stacy. So you, you so, got you got a question: Why wait thirty years to bring it forward? I mean, these are fictional stories. <laughs> well, they're, 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 uh, no, well, it's, it's, I mean, that, I mean that's, let's just say, these are the allegations. Since, since, not necessarily since about the 1970s, comic books started to get darker and darker and darker. The original right. run of DC and Marvel before, well, DC because Marvel only really became Marvel in the 1960s. But DC had um, what's called, I think it's the, the golden age in the 1930s and 1940s when you had superheroes like Batman and Superman first emerge. And they were much darker back then. Superman less so, but Batman, uh, contrary well, he, to popular well, early understanding, Superman was was like that. He wasn't dark, but he was he was like a, a bit darker than you would get in the really cartoony era in the nineteen mid nineteen fifties and nineteen sixties when the comics code began to be applied to a lot of comic books. And in fact, you can watch that on the two parter that Connor and I did on the history of superhero comics, where we covered all the way going back from the late 1800s and French comic books that were being spread around at that time. And then in the second series, when we go up to the more recent era. I know that's a bit of a tangent, but if you go back to the previous link, John. Oh, yeah. um, That gentleman in black and white looks almost identical to Report of the Week. The the, the food reviewer is is spot on. Interestingly, I think one of the things that Connor and I contribute to this is, uh, well, for, for one, this was... Connor's baby was the, um, the the part one and two of the history of superhero comics. Connor has, for a very long time, had a gigantic chronology of comic books that he's been trying to sort out, specifically with DC, because that's his favorite one. So this was a, a labor of love for him. But we also add greater uh, cultural and societal context into it as well. So for instance, the Comics Code Authority, which came in in the 1950s, to regulate and censor a lot of comic books and was complete nonsense because a lot of the goals that it was aiming for, you could say, would actually be somewhat virtuous in trying to prevent um, uh, cultural subversion by people, but were pushed by the sorts of people who, say, for instance, saw that Batman had an adopted son as a sidekick and looked and went, gay, obviously nonsense that young boy, despite there being no indication whatsoever, kind of deranged and subversive and very suspicious mindset that sees a man and his adopted son and assumes that one must be buggering the other at some yeah, but point. Wh- why would he make him dress up in tights? A superhero outfit. Right. You're not supposed to think yeah, they're like that green deep tights. into that particular logic. Right. But do you think anybody in green tights is automatically being buggered? Yes. Did something happen to... Did you have to wear green tights at any point in your youth, Dan? Is that... No. Josh, you're the therapist here. I think we've got... A, I'm not a therapist, but sure. We've, we've got a subject here for you. What do you think of when you think of green tights, Dan? Well, I... <laughs> I don't, Dan, I think you're going off of more you, recent you, you, cultural you, you, memes that have been propagated purely you can't, you can't, what? You of can't, the strange opinions propagated by the people who put these ideas forward in the first place. The sort of person... Oh, call up a bloody image of Robin from, from the original Batman and tell me well, that, I don't want that, the is, desk, that, I, that is raging masculinity. Okay, if that happens and the desk lifts and elevates slightly, I'm yeah. going to be very suspicious right, move on, here. Move on, next one, <laughs> next one. What I'm saying is the person who was involved in that, we're, we're, there was a very interesting connection because if you're aware of Alfred Kinsey, which I'm sure anybody here, you are aware of Alfred Kinsey, right? He was one of the guys who propagated the sexual revolution uh, he had a book in the 19, late 1940s and then a follow-up in the 1950s that insinuated that he that half of all American males were homosexual and were just repressing it, uh, like something right. ridiculous, like 60% of them had been cheating on all of their wives. With I'm going to channel my inner men. football hooligan and say, pedo. Yeah, and uh, also r- research the sexuality of young boys. And it turned out that in doing the research, one, he'd been interviewing a lot of prison populations of men who were in prison and presumably if they had wanted a sexual outlet and they were only surrounded by other men had to express it in a very particular way which is where he suddenly got that 50% of all American men are gay that's a from. very curious choice of sample that seems yes. deliberate to me because any any person who's involved in research with half a brain would know that going to a prison population isn't necessarily a very repre- representative sample 
of the entirety of the population, is it? Yes, he, and he should uh, have chosen somewhere more neutral, like a I don't know Catholic church or something. <laughs> he'd also uh, the same result. Also filled with poofters. Um, he'd also been going around asking an actual paedophile about his uh, and had a very very infamous table in one of the works on the amount of um, uh, satisfaction. So how does somebody to uh, comics? Uh, because of the fact that the sort of person who was involved in the Comics Code Authority in promoting these standards in comics was related to ah, so professionally did he, did he related to Alfred Kinsey back then. Yes, it was captured from a very very early time back in the 1950s. And that's one of the interesting uh. things is that superhero comics for a very long time have been a conduit medium through which liberal propaganda can be put out there essentially. I'm a person who really enjoys old superhero comics and I enjoy the stories of them. But I think one of the things that I've discovered going through a lot of these old series is just how deep a lot of this has been from a very, from a very young age. Because, of course, if you're a, a parent and you get your kids a comic book every week or every month, uh, you mainly just worry, is there inappropriate material in it that would mean too violent or too much sex? Yes. These old comic books from back then wouldn't have had that much stuff like that in it, but there would have been much more subversive and difficult ah. to spot so messaging for them. Is, is the Comics Corner actually about cultural subversion uh, uh, sort of unintentionally at first it was just because connor and i wanted to talk about comic books and a series and we really enjoyed doing that but as we've been going through we've been discovering rediscovering that a lot of the series that both of us and the stories that both of us enjoyed when we were younger right. either just weren't as good as we remember although some of them some of them mm. are for instance the long halloween batman batman is an interesting case here because the very nature of Batman's character is such that it's very difficult to write a left-wing Batman story. Mm. It's really difficult, and writers have struggled to do it for years and failed constantly because he is somebody fighting against the entropy of Gotham and to re-establish order in the face of chaos, which is I, exemplified. I, you could get a left-wing like Batman if his parents died in a famine. That would work. <laughs> W would that work though? <laughs> yeah. Oh, actually, to be fair, there is one story we've not covered it, but it's called Bat uh, Superman Red Sun, where um, the, it's a, a Elseworlds story where Superman landed in the USSR instead of uh, America and became basically the Soviet man. And Connor actually told me about yeah. this. Before. And Batman in that story is an anti-Soviet subversive agent trying to bring down the communist world order. It, 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 Based it, Batman. it could have yes. been. It, it could have been worse. He could have just landed in LA or something. <laughs> yeah, instead of Kansas. Yeah, San, yeah, San Francisco, and he would have. Can you imagine what Superman would be like? He, yeah, one of the commenters Probably has said his parents died on January sixth. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley well Babbitt. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, she, she was, was the only that. one, right? Lord Inquisitor Hector Rex said that. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Sure. So, um, th there's obviously there's different elements of comic book stories that we can take and examine, and right. not all of them are going to be this way. But it seems that quite a few of them, also primarily because a lot of comic book writers are massive leftists. Like one of the most famous yes. writers out there from comic books, he wrote Watchmen, Batman Killing Joke, lots of other series that are very, uh, very well known, like V for Vendetta. Yes. Alan Moore is fat communist Hagrid. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I've seen a picture of him. He does look he, like that. He's, he's honestly quite a revolting man who accidentally stumbled on a few stories and wrote a few stories in the 1980s that were genius and absolutely brilliant. And I can't really deny that. But then he writes a character like Rorschach from Watchmen, who is the quintessential reactionary character, and then complains that everybody related to him and thought that he was the hero the entire way through. And now, as a result, I believe the most recent news story I've seen regarding Alan Moore is that he's planning on donating all the money that he made from film adaptations of his work to BLM. I mean, honestly, BLM have already been known for about two, two and a half years to be even more so than we already knew when they first came out. A bunch of mansions yeah. the two we already knew that they were a grift, Alan. Maybe you should look into that before you give them money because you're just buying them more mansions. But anyway. Oh, well. Okay, fine. Yeah. Uh, it does what, what, seem what? like a, a total boomer. Oh, he's worse. He's, like, he's an actual communist. I was going to say, I've watched Watchmen, the film, and the only character, well not the only character, but the character I sort of sympathised with the most was Rorschach. Rorschach. Yeah, ev everybody does. Well, that's interesting because 
the film adaptation of it by Zack Snyder tr- <laughs> is accidentally not subversive in the way that the comic book is because Zack Snyder being um, a more si- not not simple minded but not <laughs> not as willing to deep dive into these. He's the sort of guy who'll write something and film something just because he looks at it and goes, that's really cool. Um, saw Rorschach and went... this level yeah. message, not the subversion level. Yes, and he went, right. Rorschach's really cool <laughs> and just made him really cool. He was my f- base, actually. Yeah, yeah. In, in the film. Would you ever do anything on 2000 AD? Did you ever read 2000 AD? I really want to. I was never really... I was not really into any of the, the Marvel American... or DC stuff, but I did... Read a fair bit of 2000 AD, you know, Judge Dredd and yeah. Rogue Trooper. And I really stuff. do want to cover some Judge Dredd at some point soon because we are very um, US centric with the sorts of comics that we cover. Even if the writers, some of them are Scottish and English from the uh, from the British invasion from the 80s, I still want to focus on some of these old English comic books as well because 2000 AD is really cool. Is Judge Dredd an English character? Yeah, 2000 AD are a British imprint. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. Yeah, I think a lot of people just assume that he's American, but he's a British yes. character originally. Well, what the character? Well, well, I, in origin of the people who wrote it. Oh, okay, in, in, I'm sorry. 2080. Uh, okay. Yeah, I know I that. Say, Mega City One's not supposed to be in Hampshire or anything, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Although it's feeling more and more like it could be. <laughs> it, it could be Portsmouth. <laughs> yeah, when when we get the uh, South East London Super State. Yes, in the Isn't corner it, of England. Uh, I remember reading somewhere that there's a sort of colloquialism that Portsmouth is actually one of the most densely built up places, like city. It, it, it is Portsmouth. I, Portsmouth. I don't really remember has, it very well. Yeah, but the, the the stat that um, I always remember for Portsmouth is that um, Portsmouth residents have a greater linear frontage of motor car than they do of house. Blimey! Because basically, they've 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 pretty much all got two cars, and two cars is wider than the average house in Portsmouth. So. I mean, yeah, so if you're what? fat in Portsmouth, yeah, Portsmouth is just impossible. Right, so this is like the opposite problem that I have going into old houses where all the door frames are too short for me. <laughs> so this yeah. is this is they're just too wide. So city density goes like Tokyo, Hong Kong, Mexico City, Portsmouth. Yeah. So <laughs> okay. Well, well, I, that's I, not I really know that. Field. It's, yeah. it's basically you something it's new basically every day, just folks. It, I, I don't know about the people, but it's just impossible to drive through. <laughs> just impossible. I've heard that as well. Yeah. Yeah, I, I try to avoid driving in European and British cities as much as possible anyway, because they are not yeah. built for cars yeah. in the slightest. What, what, what's, what's the next one then? What's... So the next one was Kingdom Come and this... No, 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 go back, oh, go. John. So Kingdom Come is a very famous comic book from the 1990s that was kind of a commentary on a lot of the trends that were going on at the time. When I talk about how comics these days have a lot of very, very dark subject matter, it's more comics from the 90s and mid uh, early to mid 2000s that went really dark because nowadays you just have complete s libs yes. writing all of them so wokey left was it corrupt leftist propaganda in the 90s as well um not quite as blatant and with more of an eye on trying to tell a, con- a coherent story but all of the messaging is still there it was more trying to uphold and propagate the uh liberal order of that time, which is more to be expected given the fact that I can't a lot even of... remember what the liberal talking points in the 90s were. I mean, there's a little bit of climate change, but uh, it was all right, the 90s. Well, watch the video to find ah, out what right. exactly it is. Also, watch the video because in it, uh, Connor kind of fills in some of the gaps that were left out of the history of comics because this one came first where he took, spoke more about 90s comics. And if you look at that thumbnail there, you see that image. That's Captain America. And he doesn't have a gigantic tumour sticking out of his chest. He looks like Elon Musk yeah. there, doesn't he? That was the kind of art style that a lot of comics had in the 1990s. And that was a particularly infamous one done by an artist called Rob Liefeld, who was known for creating the most grotesquely musculatured car, um, car, uh, comic book characters ever, and also couldn't draw feet. So you would get this, but then there would never be a shot that shows the full body, so you can see the tiny, tiny little like pointed toes that he would give these people. Uh, but, That's like a beer belly moved up, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's based on um, an <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger picture from when Arnold Schwarzenegger was still p- competing in bodybuilding in the 1970s. He had a pair but, of beer breasts, apparently. I mean, Arnold Schwarzenegger had an enormous chest. Oh, well, yeah, he didn't look like that, that, though, did he? Yeah, yeah but yeah, that was a particularly strange <laughs> uh, version of that. But you got all, a lot of this art, you got the really edgy comics coming through where you'd have 
characters called things like extreme with an X at the beginning and a hyphen That's and then tree. aged really poorly. That sort of 90s naming convention where it'd be like um, a Z on the end of something and it'd just be a regular word. So let, oh, let me see. So it rubs me the wrong I'm way. I'm just getting some examples up. So Rob Liefeld himself wrote a series called Young Blood, where you had characters called things like Bad Rock, Riptide, Shaft, Shadow Hawk, Shaft, Pro- Professor Knight, and these aren't even some good. These aren't even the best. Uh, the best ones. You characters called Die Hard, things like that. Just like movie names, extreme. You wanted everything to be cool and extreme, and Kingdom Come was. Uh, a commentary on that style of comic that was coming out at the time. And then we've also spread out into not just covering Western American comics. Like, for instance, we did the fifth episode was actually on the film trilogy of Unbreakable Split and Glass, the M. Night Shyamalan film trilogy. Now, I know that his name in, among some circles of the culture is a little bit of a meme because, admittedly, he has made some absolutely terrible films in his time. And in fact, about 10 minutes near the beginning of this was me dissecting and absolutely demolishing the most recent film of his that had come out at the time called Knock at the Cabin, mm. which was absolute rubbish. Uh, uh, but this trilogy... Was that the Crop Circle one? No, that's Signs. That's 20 oh. years old, Dan. Oh, okay. <laughs> I enjoyed that film, though. I've not seen it. Um, but the, the, the series is both a superhero film series and also a commentary on the power of comic books to inspire people at the same time. So we thought it would be appropriate to do so and also rehabilitate the third part of the film series, Glass, somewhat, because a lot of people hate that. I hated it the first time I saw it, but I thought it was okay. Watching it again, I thought it held up much better than I originally thought it did. And once again, we were able to extract some story beats and elements from it that I don't think we were expecting to, like a commentary on the... uh, pathologizing of the exceptional in the modern era, where the sorts of people that we're talking about in the previous segment, when we're talking about the kinds of men who went out and did great things, the great individuals these days are pathologized from a young age. If you're a young man that shows any level exceptionalism in your life, you're immediately thrown off to the side and kind of fenced in where you're told that you've either got something wrong with you, you're majorly autistic, you need to take ADHD medication, all of this. All things that might actually, from a medical point, be true, but also might be good for them in the future to be able to well, that, go that, out and achieve that, I like things. You're I like, basically just pathologizing masculine behavior at this yes. point. Yes. I like when you said that. You said exceptional men looked at Bo, and then you said might be autistic and looked at me. <laughs> You're <laughs> welcome. <laughs> hey, some say it's the next stage of evolution. It's not, it's I have not. heard that before. Yeah, I think that was the Predator film from 2017 that said that. Wasn't that, wasn't that X-Men? <laughs> no. <laughs> That is in there. Isn't it? <laughs> no, I, don't sure it was. Think, I don't think it's the a point, theme in it. I don't think the point. Mutant, yeah, so. no, the point of X Men is they're all like potentially the next stage of evolution. Not that right. they're all autistic. They're all really good at maths. So a realistic version of X Men is just all on four chan all day long. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> exactly. That. I mean, the powers of four chan surpass the X Men at this point. I reckon. Yes, that's true. They've they've delivered more sort of actual miracles, haven't they? Yes. Right. And then we've also gone into, and this is somewhat of a controversial area among the right wing is we have taken a look at one particular Japanese comic series called Berserk, which is absolutely fantastic, a brilliant series and brilliant storytelling, which far surpasses most of every Western comic I've ever read. But some suggest that by virtue, purely virtue of it being Japanese, that it should just be immediately dismissed and said it's subversive, it's disgusting, it's degenerate. It's not. The same thing with comic books being a medium through which you can tell stories, and those stories can have good values or bad values, good storytelling or bad storytelling, applies similarly to the sorts of media that comes from Japan. And I think that there is a sort of knee-jerk reaction that a lot of right-wingers, particularly those who are terminally online, have when they react to uh, Japanese media. Because manga, anime, all of it is a medium through which to tell stories. There are tropes. Yes. that you can have on those that you might find distasteful, but those tropes aren't going to be found in every piece of media, and you should judge the media itself on the quality of the storytelling and the themes held within. 
So that's my little piece there for anybody. Who so knows. the title of this one is The Black Swordsman and the Golden Age. So is the sword black or is the, is the person wielding the sword black? Uh, the main character is Guts. He is the black swordsman. He dresses right. primarily in black with right. black cape and black armor. And also his sword is one that's been very, very influential because it's an enormous sword that's uh, not, not this big. But obviously imagine, imagine you're reading the comic and it's there. The sword is about that big on the comic page, so it's, it's right. enormous. It's that about, seems impractical. It's about, well, he's strong enough that he can deal with it, and it's been very right. influential on it's other. Compensating. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It feels like it, it it's. Um, it's uh, this. This was one that I really enjoyed doing. It was very popular because people were asking for us to cover something like Berserk, and I've been reading it over the past year or so. So, found it was a really good opportunity to talk about. It was one of the most popular episodes that we've done so far. And for anybody who did watch it, and if you haven't, you should by subscribing to the website Sargon twenty uh, Sargon with an E, yeah, with a with an E at the end, fifty percent yes. discount because he because he's on holiday for the next. There he is, weeks. right there. Look at him, yes. our Lord and Savior, yes. the man who will save the West. Um, so while he's away, get fifty percent off. Yes, and uh, look out for the next episode of Comics Corner because we might be doing a follow up because there is a lot of berserk the story and a lot of it is very very worth covering. So. That's uh, something that I really enjoyed doing. Excellent. Check that out. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content that's on the site, such as the premium articles, this one on the SMP's failing war on biological reality, with an audio track for silver and gold tiers. If you'd like to find out what else is being put out, you can follow on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.